All right, uh, so my name is uh, Becky Larson. I'm from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I have been there about 12 or 13 years now. Um, and today I'm gonna talk to you about manure emissions during agitation and processing. Um, I'm sorry, I should have been a little more specific with this title. I think most of my emissions work is typically done on for greenhouse gas emissions. But today I'm gonna talk about something a little bit different um, related to human health and safety. Um, so in Wisconsin, we recently had a few incidents where we had unfortunately had some deaths um, around manure storages. Our manure storages are generally open, and so it was kind of concerning, and we started a large initiative to first meet with a bunch of people, look at what happened, and then we were able to secure some funding to go and do some additional studies to supplement what we found. Um, I do want to mention that I had a P, uh, postdoc working on this project who was responsible for all the great data collection through the coronavirus, which was a nice challenging thing to get done. I'm sure you all had those kinds of things to work with yourself. Um, but he did uh, find a new job, which is great for him, but left me um, doing the analysis. And uh, let's say I didn't quite make it as far as I wanted to today, but I'll share with you some trends and hopefully in the, in the future, give you some more information. Um, so as I said, you know, um, in Wisconsin, most of our manure storages are just that. They're just designed to hold manure through the cold weather. We empty them completely, typically in the spring and fall. Um, and most of them are in open areas, so no barriers to prevent some gas dispersion. Uh, we had a few incidents where unfortunately, um, a few younger farmers died. Um, when they were operating their things pretty early in the morning, um, people found them unresponsive. Um, and so that was a little worrisome. Um, I think, you know, we've always known that there's dangerous gases that can be associated. Um, but I think most of our incidents before this had been in confined spaces. And so it, it kind of brought a lot of questions, a lot of concern from farmers as to, as to what was going on and, and, and why it was happening. Um, so we, we started looking at the conditions that may have been present in some of those instances, um, looking at why were we seeing increased concentrations. I would say a lot of people that initially um, responded to the scene um, thought that uh, the deaths were related to what they were calling manure gases generally, and a lot of them were associating it with methane production, um, which was the conclusion of a lot of newspapers um, even though I think a lot of us thought maybe hydrogen sulfide was the, was the bigger issue there. Um, we have a lot of different kinds of agitation systems. Um, boats uh, uh, are becoming very popular these days, I would say. Um, so they can be operated a little bit farther away, but a lot of our systems, obviously the operator is gonna be pretty close to the pit. Um, and so that is the, maybe the highest concentration, highest risk location that we're mostly concerned about. Um, this is a lovely day that we had demonstrations of manure. I think this day we accidentally sprayed a few people. That was a good day with lawyers. Um, but so lots of different systems, uh, lots of different ways to do it. Um, and we know that during these agitation events, they're important. We all know we, that it, for particularly in the systems we have, they're important because we want to reduce manure variability. But we know all of these gases are being released normally, right? We measure them. This, a lot of the studies here have been about them. Um, but I think we are concerned that a lot of times in these agitation events that the emissions might be greater. I think a lot of times when I'm measuring emissions, particularly for greenhouse gases, we kind of think of this as a blip, you know, like a very, you know, a day or a week, you know, more like two weeks or something. And so we know the emissions are greater, but um, a lot of times, particularly in modeling, we kind of say, well, it's not a huge event. We actually don't represent them, I don't think, very well during these conditions. Um, and then normally I would say, I, I mean, I would, before these incidents, I would have told producers myself that, you know, during these events, the gases might be increased. We always saw, saw issues in under barn storage, right? So I would have told those folks, you need to be careful. We had a few explosions. Um, I think someone else showed a picture of an explosion today. Um, ours, you know, like a fan would ignite it or something, but most of them were in underground pits. So I wouldn't have said this is like a huge concern or thoughts of um, places. The other thing I want to mention is we see a lot of manure processing buildings. I don't know if this is probably becoming more common everywhere, um, but so we get all these kinds of systems within here. You can see in this one, like there's a fan down here, right? One fan. We have barns that have a ton of fans, but why aren't we 
you know, designing some of these the same way. I would say I, I really like the idea of these newer processing buildings. They've been really instrumental in trying to create some value added products and helping people manage their manure more effectively um, for a whole lot of different reasons that we've all talked about. Um, but I also think there might be some current concerns for um, the ventilation in these systems as well. Um, hydrogen sulfide, um, I, I think has been talked about enough, so I won't stick on it too much today, but you can see it, you know, I think we always say after 500 ppm, you know, you have death up at 1000 ppm, where that actual mark is, it's really hard to know. Um, but I think we would, we would all agree that as you start to get higher up here, the, the, the dangers um, are pretty significant. Um, we also, in this study, looked at a variety of other gases. I'm going to focus on hydrogen sulfide today, but we also measured ammonia, carbon monoxide. We had a bunch of particulate matters. I worked with some folks in the environmental engineering um, department who built us some particulate matter sensors. So we have a whole lot of data. I think every day that we took data resulted in like 10,000 or 100,000 data points. So you'll see maybe why I only got there so much data, or at least I'm trying to blame it on that. Um, I think a lot of our farms now are subject to occupational standards, a larger farm. And so I think one of the numbers that is concerning me is that 20 ppm ceiling. I know sometimes we see at those like edge of field far away, we're talking about parts per billion. But in this study, I'm gonna show you the parts per million during these education events were definitely measured. Um, we're, I'm gonna talk a little bit about a time-weighted average. I don't believe it, you know, some time has gone by since I did this table from OSHA. Um, but I don't believe they have a time-weighted average. They may have added one, but there is one um, for another standard that I have on another slide um, that some, some occupational people put up of a one part per million eight-hour um, time-weighted average. I would say also, you know, I did a lot of reading about long-term impacts of hydrogen sulfide. They're not hugely known, and, you know, low doses, what does that mean over time? We do know these big doses for those short times are really concerning. Um, I think we all can agree in these manure things that we know a lot of what increases those risks, right? Inter increased temperatures and kind of a thing here. There's been lots of like studies that have looked at, well, once you hit a certain temperature, you might see a lot more hydrogen sulfide produced. Um, we, you know, we were thinking like inversions or different atmospheric conditions. Could that create some situation? Uh, obviously, the wind speed is really important and how much dispersion you're going to get. Um, a few of the you know, incidents I was wondering, occasionally there would be a barn where is that preventing some dispersion from going away? So we were trying to look at some of that too. Um, one of the other things that we've been talking about is the additional sulfur that's been in manure uh, recently. So if you have gypsum bedding, so that was been something we asked a lot of questions about that at one of the incidents. They had really high sulfur levels, but we didn't think it was due to gypsum bedding. It looks like wet distiller grain, uh, they might've been feeding wet distiller grains at that facility that might have had really high sulfur content there. So there's a lot of places that it might come from that they that the farmers might not think of. Um, and so, you know, we know that if you have more sulfur, you can produce more hydrogen sulfide, but which of these drivers is really getting at um, what that means? Okay, oh, I'm gonna skip that one. I like that someone <laughs> used to say, is this, I don't think this is a good idea. So I would say not this, right? We actually even recommend, I would like if everybody wore, we recommend sensors. So after we started this, before we did the research, the easiest thing to do is buy one of those personal monitors. I recommend them for hydrogen sulfide. They cost a few hundred dollars, they last 24 months. The other thing that I'm noticing though is on the farm we were having people use it at the research farm and they would go off pretty frequently, more frequently than they, then maybe we need to think about how the system is being wrong, that they're going off that frequently. But once they start doing that, they start setting them down. Obviously fatigue, alarm fatigue is actually a thing and they stop caring about that. So in the Wisconsin case, this was the facility, it was a beef facility. Um, the victim was found here. Um, the, that week had been pretty warm in the eighties, um, but in the morning time was when they were doing this like 5 a.m. They found them unresponsive at 6 a.m. The hauler that came to help um, found them here by the agitation equipment. Um, and when we had the um, coroner run the blood sample, it showed really high thiosulfate levels. Um, and so we knew there that it was above the concentrations that would cause death. So then we knew hydrogen sulfide, the other incident, the same thing, right? And so I think there were some others around the country that also were happening at the same time. We found that their, their sulfur content was really high. Uh, it was really hot that day. There was very little wind. Um, so what are the conditions that are really driving that? So 
we started looking at indoor and in outdoor assessments. In the outdoor assessments, we had 24 days of field trials. Oh, it's faster, slow, I'm talking. Um, 24 days of field trials. And um, we would do at least eight hours of measurement over that time period, right? So they'd be running the agitation equipment. We put out sensors. So we had six sets of sensors that had a GPS unit. Um, and they also had hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, carbon monoxide, part and particulate matter. So some of them were stationary. Like if you uh, were at, you know, if you were at the controls, we put one there um, and then we would put them at different distances and then some would move around, right? And one was worn as a backpack so that you could get the idea of the concentrations that were, um, that someone would be breathing. Um, the people that do health air quality that I'm partnered with said that was really important. I wouldn't have thought of that on my own. We also ran some indoor assessments um, at the facility that we have here that was actually having um, some carbon monoxide issues as well because they do have a power washer in there. And so we ran this with different um, uh, settings to look at different, I'm missing the term here, of uh, air exchange, the number of air exchange. So we would run it and we tried to figure out what was happening in there with the different air exchanges. So today I'm mostly just gonna talk about the outdoor data. I'll mention the indoor data so that if you ever wanna find it, you'll remember it's there. But so this is one study. I tried to pick out a few days um, that we saw really high concentrations and then a few where we saw some lower concentrations. We did measure half the field days were in agitation events. The other half were not. And they were scattered around a whole bunch of different farms. So I think we had at like 10 farms or eight farms and like 12, you know, it seems like kind of 12 and 12. We tried to hit them without an agitation event and with an agitation event. I'm not going to share any of the non agitation events. We got a whole lot of zeros all of those days, different temperatures, different winds conditions. So we just wanted to verify that really was the agitation that was driving some of the stuff. So you can see here, these are just the six sensors. I'm hoping one day I can show you, I've been working on some 3D modeling where you can see the GPS data and the concentration chain, but I'm terrible at it. So it's taking me a while. Um, but so they're all right here and you can use this kind of, so you'll see these, if you remember when I said those concentrations as a ceiling point or who does remember it, was it 20? Yeah. So here we are seeing a lot of spikes above 20, right? So to me, that's pretty concerning. Um, this was the temperature. So it was well over, you know, when we saw those 18 degree uh, temperatures, it's, it was definitely high up there. The wind speed was really low. I would say around maybe one or meters per second, I think pretty low wind. Um, and so this is a concerning data. I ran some of the time weighted average. So the uh, American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists has a recommendation of a one PPM per eight hour time weighted average. In this case, um, some of the sensors were even up to three PPMs for that time weighted average, right? So we're exceeding that, we're exceeding those ceiling thresholds, we're exceeding the time weighted average. Um, this would be a concerning event um, to have someone here. You see the temperature is up, up between 20 and 30, really low wind speed, really high concentrations. Lower concentrations down here, wind speed now higher, right? So we're up to about five meters per second up here. Still some peaks, but much lower than what we saw before, right? And so then we have some temperatures up here, you know, and sometimes I would look at, well, the temperature went up. Did we see a corresponding increase? No, the wind speed was a pretty good driver. The sulfur content for all of these trials, um, I was just looking at that last night to remind myself, was lower than what we saw in the one where the death was, right? But it looks to me like wind is playing a part, temperature is playing a part. Um, in this event, time weighted average all below what they would recommend, right? So in this case, um, even though there were some peaks, they didn't hit the ceiling limit that we have for hydrogen sulfide, and we didn't hit any of the time weighted average for any one of the sensors. Okay, here we go. So another high event. Again, we have lower temperatures here in the morning, um, but then we see some higher temperatures up here. The wind again was really low. So what I'm seeing is the events where we're exceeding the time weighted average or we're seeing above those ceilings have high, decently high temperatures for Wisconsin. So that might be more concerning for those of you who have higher temperatures all the time. Um, and then really low wind conditions, which were, was the case, the wind conditions were the case for the event where the person died, but in the morning, the temperature was really low. One of the other things I've been looking at, the events that were really high were later in the season, kind of like where the person died. So we've been measuring the manure temperature, which was warmer 
those later seasons than earlier in this even, even if the air temperature had gone up a little bit. All right, um, and so then you would have some events where, you know, the concentrations are pretty low, the time-weighted average, all of these were, be were below the recommendations, um, even though the temperature was really high, right? So it, and then, you know, you would have some low wind speed. So it's not clear to me with this, and I, I'm running all of the statistics, it's just, I'm not fast enough to make it for this meeting, but hopefully in a paper, we'll be able to present all that to know really statistically what might be driving. I'm concerned that even with 24 days of data, it might not be enough to pick one of those drivers out. Um, but if I was recommending now to the producers I work with, I would say really low wind conditions is a very, is a time where I would be very nervous to be out there being spreading and at least at those times where your monitor or, you know, agitating is only a two, you know, week event, spring and fall, where your monitor then, even if you get fatigued other times. So the indoor study, um, I uh, have lots of mess of data, but we've been running it at different, um, we'll let it get to steady state and then change the um, air exchange for a few hours. And what we're seeing is, of course, at lower air exchange rates, we're, we're doing some common ones that they use for barns and some others. And um, I know I'm probably out of time. So, um, at, okay, at some point I will um, maybe do another presentation on all the data for the indoor study and the recommended things that we have here. Um, this thank you to the USDA for funding this um, and Anurag for all gathering all this data in some very hot, lovely weather. So thank you. Um, I read a um, I read a paper where it was talking about how uh, hydrogen sulfide emissions from lagoons could be uh, enhanced by atmospheric pressure change with the uh, fronts moving in. Is that something um, you had a chance to look at? Yeah, so we measured the pressure. Um, I didn't graph it on here because these graphs were insane already. It really didn't change very much over the course of any of these days. So um, I thought maybe we thought with the inversions and the change in pressure that day that happened, that we think happened based on nearby weather things that that might have had an impact to like trap some of the gases closer to the ground and prevent dispersion. Um, I didn't see, you know, in our studies that we got a lot of pressure changes throughout one day. Um, it just didn't happen. We, you know, you try to catch the data. So I would say I didn't see it as much of a impact to what we did here, but obviously we couldn't catch that condition. And the statistics will tell me a little bit if I have enough data across sites to be able to know if that was impactful. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I don't know how good of a question this is, but when you mentioned the personal monitors mm -hmm. and using them, you know, um, when they're doing agitation and removal, would that give you an indication prior to a, to a danger situation? Or is it, I mean, do we think this is like a high level instantaneously that you can't predict? And no. So most of them will sense, uh, they're set to alarm at 10 PPM, 10 PPM. A lot of the personal ones that are um, already set to a certain level. Um, so it would go off at 10 PPM, which would tell you, you know, what we've been telling producers is at that point, you need to get away from the area. You need to develop these plans as well ahead of time. So it was a big thing. It's the saddest thing when we would see one person go in and then multiple fem members of the family would um, unfortunately die in a circumstance. So we are, we are trying to push people that when the alarm goes off, you need to get away from the area, um, have a plan for where you need to go, what you're going to do then to try to assess, you know, if you want to go back, let the let some time, look at the wind, look at the temperature, maybe you should halt what you're doing and wait for a later date. Um, so that's the potential. And then there's a lot of sensors where you can actually set the alarm. Um, and so I wasn't advocating for going much lower than 10 PPM because sometimes it'll beep kind of constantly when you're working around manure. Um, and so there could be, you know, people that might advocate for, well, maybe you need to set it closer to that 20 PPM because there isn't necessarily in a huge immediate concern at 20 PPM um, but it is a warning to get there, but most of them are set at 10 PPM, which, which should give you enough time. Um, I, I'm not saying there isn't an event where a flush could happen. Um, I don't think we saw that in the data, but um, you know, uh, we'll keep looking at it.